Well, hey, Redeemer. It's good to see all of you. It's great to be uh, here, and I'm excited to be back with you this weekend. I am excited also about all these questions. Thanks for asking all this. I'm, there's no way we're going to get to all of it. We don't have five services like with the end time stuff. So we've just got one, so we're going to do our best to answer as many of them as possible. But before I do that, I would love for these guys to introduce themselves. And so, Owen... Yes, my name is Owen Strand, and I'm a booming voice, apparently, for you. Uh, I am I am coming to you all the way from Arkansas, uh, where I am the provost of a small school called Grace Bible Theological Seminary. I'm originally from Maine, so just file that away. And uh, I'm married to Bethany, and we have three kids. And um, those are the basics I like. Uh, Churchill biographies running and walks on the beach. So there you go. <laughs> How in the world am I going to follow that up? <laughs> all right. Good evening, everyone. So great to see you all here. Uh, Daryl Harrison, uh, day job. I'm director of digital platforms for Grace to You, which is the media ministry of Pastor John MacArthur. I come all the way from you, all the way to you, rather, from the People's Republic of California. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It's so wonderful to be in the free state of Arizona. That's right. Amen. Amen. I mean that in all seriousness. <laughs> so I'm not doing anything at Grace to You. I also co-host the Just Thinking podcast with uh, Virgil Walker. Oh, thanks. Wow, great. So my wife, Melissa, is here uh, with me. And um, let's see, my hobbies... Um, Man, I love to write, love studying the Puritans. I love to work out. I love, love to do my thing on the treadmill, get some cardio in. I'm a huge college football fan, and uh, season's about to kick off. Matter of fact, it's already kicked off, so it's hard leaving the hotel because my home team, Georgia Tech, was playing on, uh, on TV. <laughs> I'm originally from Atlanta, so I'm a big Tech fan. And uh, So anyway, love, love Redeemer. Love all of you guys, so thanks for being here. All right, on. Absolutely. So guys, we're very honored to have you both here because the, the, the whole idea behind this Christ and Culture evening is that the culture has changed so much, so quickly. There is so much disruption um, going on right now that a Christian looking out at the world is going, I've got I've to have 10 different answers to 10 different things. I've got to have a new one every day. Things are constantly changing. And I thought, what, what, a, what, what a, a, a wonderful thing to have both of you come here and be able to just help us with some of the questions that we have. And uh, so I've got 20 something, 28 questions here, aside from my own questions. And so... We're going to see how many we're going to get through this evening, but really for this is for the benefit of the flock. This is a way for us to shepherd people on a large scale to say, here are the things that you're going through in the culture and what's some advice, biblical advice that we could give you. And so I'm going to get us started. We have a number of questions like this one, but it is... Um, I work for one of the largest woke companies in the world, and I'm constantly having to take these inclusion meetings and learning tools, et cetera. If I misgender someone, even accidentally, I'm fired. I can't speak about my faith or state the fact that I refuse to call a biological man or woman or vice versa. I've kind of refused to wear the pride t-shirts they send us as well as participate in the group photos. It's a miracle I haven't been fired for that. I work from home now. I feel guilty working for them, but it's everywhere. Am I sinning by not refusing to do the required inclusion training? So a softball to get you started <laughs> today. <laughs> well, first of all, I would just say it's very hard to live in Babylon. And so I think it's helpful for us all to go back to our Old Testament and read the book of Jeremiah and read about the experience of uh, the exiles in Babylon and know afresh what they felt. Uh, I, I, am, I will give a quick answer in a minute, but it's really essential for us to really mine, not just there in the Old Testament, but Esther and Daniel and other examples that we can find of faithful men and women of God who have been in tremendous places of difficulty, like honestly, many of you are now and many people watching this are mm -hmm. and so we have great compassion for that and there's great hope really in knowing 
that this is not actually the first time this has happened. It's been very difficult to be a true follower of God before. So I would not say to this person, they need to quit the company and get out and never be in a inclusion training seminar or whatever it may be. There are some lines that I probably would want to draw. I couldn't wear a pride t-shirt or something like that if I'm in a yeah. big company and I'm, I'm forced to. I think Christians need to know that they could lose their jobs for this and mm -hmm. that um, that's a worthy calling, honestly, if it's to happen. But I wouldn't say, on the other hand, they have to leave a fallen place automatically. I actually would say to this person, God has probably put you there to be a witness in some form. Even if you're working from home, that's okay. Um, be salt and light however much you can. We're going to need Christians all through our culture and society and government and so on and so forth, not just now, but in days to come. So I wouldn't say quit. I would say be as faithful as you can. If there comes a point when you can't, you just can't cross that line. Mm -hmm. Then know that, again, you have real encouragement from the Bible, saints who said, mm -mm, no further. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm throwing myself into the hands of God, but God is going to care for me even if I lose my job. Yeah. Yeah, there's really not much for me to add to that. I think that situation that's being addressed in that question, uh, John, is just another example where the principle, and I emphasize principle, the principle of giving to Caesar what is Caesar and giving to God what, what is God applies. Um, to the extent, as, as Owen just said, when you get to that line, uh, you need to be prepared to draw that line and hold to it. Um, we are going to, we as Christians are going to be presented, if you haven't already been presented with, if either not that exact situation or a situation is going to come where you're going to have to identify what your line is. And uh, we've all been called to bear a cross. It's Luke 9, 23. Your cross may be that you may have to lose your job to stand for Christ, to give to God what is God, and refuse to give what is God's to Caesar. Uh, Caesar is more, again, on principle, Caesar is more than the government. We, we tend to think of Caesar only in terms of what role the government plays. But Caesar is any institution, entity, organization, individual that has authority. Uh, if you're working for someone else, there are certain rules, certain protocols, that as a believer, as a good witness, you want to abide by those. Up until and unless you are asked, demanded, required, mandated to violate what God has said you either should do or shouldn't do. And it's, I love how I want to wrap that up. You have to be able to trust your, so you, you have to get in the mindset right now before you even face that situation. You have to have the conviction right now that when that moment comes, you're gonna stand, even at the cost of my livelihood, knowing that your home is not here. So ultimately, what do you have to lose? Comfort? Certainty? A good night's sleep? I mean, think about that. What, ask yourself right now, to, just to yourself, question yourself, what is my line? What is my line? Just think about that. That's super helpful and challenging. And um, it's also critical. I would just add that it's also critical to think, what will God think of this decision when I stand before him? Will he say, good job? Or will he say, what were you thinking? Yeah. And if I may, John, uh, your comment just brings to mind, I think it's in Revelation 21, <clears throat> where Christ, uh, I forget the exact verse, where, but Christ is delineating a series of sinful behaviors that warrant those individuals being thrown into the lake of fire. The first behavior, the first sinful behavior that he mentions is cowardice. Hmm. He mentions cowardice before murderers, before liars, before adulterers, before any other. That word in the Greek is the same word that we get 
from Paul to Timothy where he says, we have not been given the spirit of timidity, of fear. That's the same Greek word for cowardice mm -hmm. in Revelation. Um, now I know we are all flesh, we are all fallen. We are not yet glorified. So fear, anxiety, it's a natural part of being sinful. But I have to go back to what Owen said. It's a trust issue. So you have to make up your mind right now. Do I trust God? The same God that, that you're trusting to get you home safely tonight is the same God you can trust in that situation. Same God. You had not changed. You don't need any more trust in that line that you have to cross, or that you have to set. You don't need any more trust in God for that than you do in, get, in him getting you home safely tonight. Because he's, he's not mutable. He, he doesn't waver like we do. He doesn't. He has seen that situation before eternity. You see, but that's the kind of trust, that's the kind of faith we have to have in this God in whom we profess to believe. That when that line that I drew manifests itself, when it comes to fruition, and I say, no, I can't wear the prior t-shirt. No, I will not add a pronoun identifier to my email signature. I'm not doing that. God created me in his image, male and female. And your supervisor says, well, if you refuse, we have to terminate you. Okay, here's my access card, I'm out. And you trust God before that situation comes, before. So this next question I actually should have asked first and um, because all the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight really doesn't matter if this question isn't answered. And the question is from Jacob Ginter, what does it mean to be saved? Uh, to be saved means that you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It means that you believe even to the point of full trust and, and knowledge uh, that Jesus died on the cross about 2,000 years ago and rose from the grave three days after that, ascended to the Father 40 days after that, and now sits at the Father's right hand in glory on high. And you find in the cross of Christ all your righteousness. You find in it all your forgiveness of your sin, your sin deserving eternal judgment from a holy God. And uh, so you have confessed that sin to God, you've repented of it, you've turned from it, and now you have asked God to change you and make you anew. If you have trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ and renounced any effort at saving yourself, any religious system, any uh, attempt to add to the blood of Christ your own righteousness, then you are a believer, you're born again. And you can never be unborn again. You can never lose your salvation. You can't out sin the forgiveness of God. Um, you will want to follow God. You will want to join a <clears throat> sound church and uh, serve in it as a member like this one. But Amen. Um, Amen. But that will be the, the heartbeat of your Christian faith. Amen. Anything to add? Yeah, I'll only add to that that to be saved means to, to, to no longer be under God's wrath. Amen. That that you're rightfully do, according to John three thirty six, is to acknowledge that there is a God, that there's a God who created you uh, deliberately, uh, and that you are accountable to Him from the very mil first millisecond of your existence, uh, and that one day you're going to be accountable uh, and stand before Him, according to Romans fourteen twelve. You're going to stand before Him as an individual and give an account for how you lived your life. Um, and it means to acknowledge that, you know, there is nothing within me, as Paul said in Romans 7, there is nothing within me that warrants uh, justification before this holy God. That God is holy. He is purely holy. There is nothing of darkness within or unrighteousness within him. But that you stand by merely existing, you stand unrighteous before God. And that you're accountable to this God for uh, the wrath that is justly do you for your sins. But as Owen pointed out, you are trusting in God's son who came into the world, according to Matthew 121, to save his people from their sins. 
that you are acknowledging that only by the righteousness of Christ imputed to you can you stand justly, forgiven, clean before this holy God. So that's what it means to be saved. Yeah, and, and just let me reiterate again, if, if this question isn't answered, all the answers to the other questions are secondary. That this is the primary question. And we'll actually be talking more about this tomorrow night and Sunday morning as we get back into John chapter 6. So next question, guys. There's been a ton of uh, reaction against wokeness coming into places like Target, Budweiser, Disney, even even the Dodgers, which is horrible. Um, <laughs> But they're, they're marketing themselves with using anti-Christian woke ideology. And so talk to us about about boycotts. Are you do you do you participate in boycotts? Um, what, what Christians and boycotts? What, what do you think about that? Personally, I'm not a fan of boycotts. I've never participated. In, and when I say I'm not a fan of boycotts, but when I use the word boycott, what I'm saying there, just to give some context, I'm not a, an, an, an advocate of organized protests. Uh, you can boycott the personal level, and that's what I normally would do. Um, but when I choose to, to boycott a company or, or uh, to be more explicit, when I choose to take my business away from an organization, we'll put it that way, I keep that to myself. I, 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 apply, I apply Jesus's principle in the gospel where he says, when you give, you, you know, you don't broadcast it. You don't you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You don't post it on Twitter. I don't post I'm it on not Twitter, parking here you know, anymore. I may post everything else on Twitter, but I don't only post that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> anyone who anyone in this room who follows me on Twitter, they, they, they understand what I mean by that. But follow me on Twitter at your own risk. I'm, I'm just saying. But. Um, again, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not being dogmatic uh, about this being a principle or precept that you should apply. You, you, you have the freedom, the grace to make your own decision um, as a believer. So I'm not dictating to anyone. I'm just saying um, uh, if the decision is made to take your business from an organization, my only uh, caveat there in terms of counsel would be to, to just check your heart for the right motive. Uh, make sure your motive for doing that is grounded in the gospel, um, that you are doing this as a witness for Christ. You're not necessarily doing this for socioeconomic reasons uh, to, to, you know, uh, hurt the company financially or whatever. Um, your rationale must be grounded in the gospel. You're taking a stand for Christ. You're taking a stand for being a good steward of the finances that God has given you. Um, and that is that motivation from your heart that is warranting you making this decision. Um, you got companies like some of the ones that John uh, named. Um, understand that they're probably not going to change their mind regardless of who boycotts them. That's probably not it's not going to happen. So that can't be your motive. You can't be um, so anti uh target on principle that you think by uh, taking your business away from them, oh, this will show them. No, I won't. Not going to show them. Your concern is stewardship. Your concern is biblical stewardship. That's got to be your conviction. If you choose to do that, that's all I'm saying. If you choose to do that, let make sure you check your own heart, examine yourself, as Paul says that your motives are right, because we are all ambassadors for Christ. And that's just one way that you can live that ambassadorship out. Yeah, I love what Daryl said about stewardship. Um, the Bible doesn't speak directly to the issue of boycotts. So I think there's Christian freedom here. I think a godly person <clears throat> could participate in a boycott. A godly person could not participate in a boycott. Personally, I'm very thankful for the some kind of boycott that my own family participated in in June and July of Target because it has meant substantially greater family income than <laughs> many, many months of my 18 years of marriage. So 
Um, Target, Target should just have approached me and said, do you want a portion of your net worth to be transferred to us directly from your paycheck? And I would have said, yes, I do. And it would have just saved us all a lot of time and a lot of trouble, a lot of credit card swiping. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is a place for a Christian saying, uh-uh, no, you got a Satanist designing tuck swimsuits for transitioned kids and we are not doing this. Uh-uh. I don't think you participate if you do, as Daryl rightly said, thinking this now solves America's problems, right? It's kind of like elections. It doesn't solve problems. It might help in some situations and stall some things and push that back. But the ultimate problem isn't solved. We just have to remember that. However, we can make companies feel it. We still have social and economic agency in this country. Who knows how long we'll have it. So use it while you have it. Um, I would just say, wrapping it up, that we just have to remember, again, as I said a few minutes ago, we're in Babylon now, effectively. So I go to a text like Jeremiah 29, 5. What are, a lot of these questions are going to be, how do we live here? What do we do? do when do we opt out? What, and I would just say, you go to Jeremiah 29, 5, beautiful passage, underrated passage um, of scripture, build houses and live in them, plant gardens. That is one of my favorite uh, commands in all the scripture, <laughs> plant gardens. So wives now have abundant justification for saying to their husband, see, we got to have a big garden. We got to take over the entire backyard, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. This is an exile. This is in the most fallen city in the old covenant era but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This, this isn't against boycotts, but just remember that it's hard to be in Babylon and yet it's good and right that we fully participate. We not flee. We not opt out. We're not trying to uh, exit all blue states and all move collectively to red states and let the blue state fail and then move back to claim it. No, we're supposed to be right here in Babylon planting gardens and possibly boycotting Target. <laughs> so, they're incredibly helpful. Is this helpful so far? It's making sense? Okay. So... Amen. So as uh, wokeness was in academia in these kind of cloistered away, just a couple of radicals. Now it's spreading all throughout everything. And uh, the question that, that we're asked here is uh, what is the main goal and game of social justice? What do they ultimately want to be satisfied? Can they even articulate it? I almost want to take those questions in reverse, and I think I will. Uh, can it be articulated by the woke? No. Um, I'm not being facetious when I say that there are varying voices from the woke side. You never get the same message from the same two people. They don't even know what it is. Owen does a great book, a great job, rather, in his book, Christianity and Wokeness, of defining what wokeness is, by the way. He does a great, great job of that. But the, the woke can't even define it. They can't even define what it is. They can't define it, and if you can't define it, you can't articulate it. What they'll use is that they'll weaponize emotionalism to try to convince you of something that they're not even convinced of. So wokeness, and, and I so appreciate John and Redeemer doing this, this theme tonight on Christ and the culture. What you have to do, I've said this often, every, every single Christian in this room is a theologian. Every single one. The only question is, are you a good theologian or are you a bad one? You are responsible to be the best theologian you can be. And for myself, I like to say that I'm a, I'm a Godfather apologist. So what I mean by that, any of you have seen the Godfather trilogy, I think it's Godfather Part Two. <clears throat> Godfather Part Two, where young Michael Corleone, he's taking over the family business. He's talking to one of his associates. He says, one thing my father always taught me, he taught me to keep my friends close, but my enemies closer. Now, how does that apply to you as a Christian theologian and an apologist? is that when it comes to wokeness, for example, you sharpen your apologetic skills by reading the woke. You read their books, you read their white papers, you watch their podcasts, you watch their videos, you watch them on the news. You get to understand your enemy so well 
that you can articulate their message better than they can. And that's going to make you a better apologist for the gospel on the whole. Theologically speaking, wokeness is soteriology. Wokeness is inherently a doctrine of salvation. The only thing is, is that in wokeness, they have exchanged seats with God. Whereas mankind now sits on the throne, God has been subjugated to this false idea of equality and equity. And they get those two terms confused as well. The woke would have you believe that in a sinful, now they don't use these this context, but you as a, as a believer, you would use, use this, these terms in this vernacular. Wokeness would have you believe that in a sinful, depraved, inherently sinful, depraved world, that there should be fairness and equality. Now think about how nonsensical that is. Equality is a myth. It's a myth. But what the woke will do, they will take advantage of, the as it relates to the church, they will take it, and this, is, this happened with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a prime example of how they took advantage of the naivete of believers who weren't equipped to exegete what Black Lives Matter when they said matter. We just assumed that they meant the same thing we did in terms of equitable treatment of all of God's image bearers, regardless of your ethnicity. Equitable treatment of all of God's image bearers, regardless of, of your uh, whether you were heterosexual or a practicing non-heterosexual, you're still an image bearer of God, even in your sinfulness. But we didn't latch on to that. So wokeness will employ a dialectic that tries to tap into your emotions at the cost of your mind, at the expense of your mind, you see. And they're winning. Why do I say they're winning? Because you've got corporate DEI programs, which are, which is nothing more than uh, legally qualified dis ethnic discrimination in hiring. 96% of the DEI officers in corporate America are black. And the D is supposed to stand for diversity. Hmm. I mean, what's the diversity in that? You know? You've got uh, the reparations movement picking up steam. We won't even get into that. That's another conference I have to come back for, John. Yeah. Well, you're going to come back richer because California just passed some laws that they're going to give you <laughs> millions of dollars. <laughs> See, but here, here's what they're not telling. Here's, here's what they're not telling these Californians. They're not telling them that the, the state's probably going to take about 70 percent of that. So your two point your two point one million is going to turn into about six hundred thousand real quick after those taxes are removed. So, but anyway, that's another yeah. conversation. Can you get that on the calendar? Absolutely, oh, I got it. You got it. But see, wokeness is proposing a false idea of uh, equality, fairness. That's all subjective, and 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 the payoff, John, to answer the, the question finally. The payoff is to get paid. When you study the landscape of wokeness, every single solution that they are proffering has to do either with money or political power. And that's not the end game. The end, there is no end game. <laughs> The end game is to continue to get you to acquiesce to their demands so that they keep getting paid. And they keep getting paid. And part of that payment, I hate to be so blunt, not really, because if you listen to me on the podcast, I just. <laughs> yeah, you don't hate to be blunt at all. I hate to be blunt at all. <laughs> do I need to repent of lying just now? Did I just, <laughs> it's just a mistake. That's all just it was. It's an oversight. It's a mistake, yeah. <laughs> Part of, part of the world getting that payoff is to see p many people who look like many of you in this room suffer. They envy you because of how God created you. 
They envy you on the basis of a static aspect of your personhood, your melanin, of which we're all really the same color, we're just different shades of the same spectrum. They want to see you suffer. Now there's an extreme dynamic of wokeness. We're talking about the, so the, the more Marx, Marx, the cultural Marxist end of the spectrum. They want to see you dead. I've seen them say this. They want to see you dead. So wokeness is sort of an elevated um, doctrine of salvation whereby that, is, that salvation occurs here in the temporal by bringing about a material uh, heaven, if you will, that's totally material, it's totally, it's, it's totally either monetary or political, at the expense of many of you in this room, and you're suffering for it. Very well laid out agree with everything said there would would only uh, just really build off of what Daryl said and say Marxists seek the complete destruction of the world as God made it. Daryl alluded to this, but um, Marx actually wanted in the late 19th century not merely to radicalize economic engagement. Marx actually wanted to destroy the family. He wanted to destroy the natural family, the God-made family. And Marxism today wants the same thing. Marxism today wants to destroy traditional authority structures. So it doesn't want there to be a father and mother in the home. It doesn't want kids to be cared for by said father and mother. Um, the modern form of Marxism that we're dealing with doesn't believe in any static form of sexuality. Uh, right form of sexuality. It wants to abolish the hegemony of the heterosexual. It wants to destroy uh, the rich. Anybody who has more than anyone else, going back to Marx's economic program, is, is wrong for having that uh, unequal distribution of resources. And you can continue. And so um, what we are up against in America, I'll say this and wrap it, but what we are up against, not wrap it as in like rhyme it. Oh, bummer. Spit it. You're not talking bummer. about spit Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, sorry. That's later. Yes, that's, that's later. later. <laughs> I'll wrap my remarks. I will conclude my remarks. I keep saying this. But um, what, what we are up against is really two visions of America, two visions of the human person, two visions of the family, the free market. And we've got to just dig in. Everyone here has to recognize, not in a fearful way, we're not supposed to fear the darkness, but at the same time, dig in, get ready to fight, not in hate of flesh and blood, but to fight for what remains, strengthen what remains in this country. Stand for the church, stand for religious liberty, stand for the family, wherever you are with whatever influence you have in your sphere, wokeness is an alternate vision of flourishing and life itself. And it is a zero sum game, baby. So buckle up and get ready to fight. John, can I just uh, yeah. append something to that real quick? What you just heard Owen uh, break down for you is the complete agenda that Black Lives Matters had. Destruction of the nuclear family. When we say nuclear, I mean the biblical family model. Uh, Destruction of any uh, removal or of, of any uh, presence of the heterosexual father, the masculine father in the family, in the home. Um, I have to recall uh, a couple years ago, Virgil and I did two episodes on Black Lives Matter, a total of six hours of content on BLM. Uh, that was the first time when we released those two episodes together uh, we skyrocketed to the number one podcast on Apple Podcasts for the first time. We got over a million and a half downloads of those two episodes combined. That episode, And I mentioned that only to say that those episodes got such deep penetration across the cultural landscape that Black Lives Matter went in and redesigned their entire website and took out a lot of the content that we had cited in those episodes. But they literally said explicitly on their website, this is what we're after. So you have to understand the three co-founders of Black Lives Matter were all lesbians. They were all lesbian Marxists. They said this themselves, self-confessed lesbian Marxists. One of them was even married to a woman. 
So when you hear Owen talk about Marxism, organizations like BLM have elevated, you know, traditionally, organically, there's usually three phases of Marxism. There's the scientific Marxism, historical Marxism, and there's the economic Marxism. <clears throat> Critical race theory kind of elevated that and, and brought the element of ethnicity into it. So you have sort of an ethno-Marxism going on that has elements of all those other three components sort of blended in there. But BLM was very, they were, they were quite egregious in, in sort of executing on that philosophy in society. And, the, and much of the church got captured by that. Um, but I love what Owen said in that wokeness is going to give you two totally separate visions of not just America, but the world. He's absolutely right. They want to destroy the West. They want to destroy. Guys, they mean this. And when they when I say they want to destroy the West, they mean Christianity. They don't want to, Islam is in the West. I know, I know Islam is primarily Eastern, but they, Islam has a presence in the West. Buddhism has a presence in the West. Hinduism, Taoism, Maoism, you, all these other isms are also present in the West. But, but something about, there's something in the, in, in, the, in, in the Marxist ideology that despises the freedom that the West enjoys by virtue of Christianity. This is why you must study your enemies. Do not walk around in this culture right now unarmed. Don't do that. Yeah, you, you, you were saying earlier, Owen, that there's the, the days of, of uh, being passive are, are over. That we can't just kind of exist and live our lives and it's no big deal. Everything's going to work out because basic there's a there's a cultural uh, consensus about things that kind of matches Christianity and some overarching ways like that's that's gone now. That's completely gone. That, that the passivity that we could have had, the comfort we could have had, like that's gone. And the, the sooner that we come to that conclusion the better it will be for us. Because the, the Marxist revolution understands that the family, that basic reality is described by the scriptures. All of those things keep people from jumping into the revolution. The revolution cannot happen unless all these institutions are destroyed, they're dismantled. And so once they're dismantled, then the revolution can, can advance. Then, then we can turn your children into activists for the revolution. And so if, if we got to turn them against you, well, hey, got to got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That's just the way it goes. And so it, so the, the days of just letting things happen, hey, it's all going to work out in the end. Like, those days are over. You were saying earlier, those days are over. Um, and, and you've written a very good book about this called Stand that um, I'm guessing many have heard of, but is excellent. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm being but being serious, I wasn't paid. I wasn't given a LaCroix <laughs> yeah. backstage just to say that. Um, although if anyone has one, I'll take it. No, kidding. Um, we've got to recognize something Daryl said just a minute ago. Man, whew, it's fun to be back on stage with you, my man. My man. <laughs> because um, wokeness really does hate manhood. It hates strong manhood. Feminism, which is kind of a branch of wokeness, it's really a multi-headed hydra. So how's that for an image? Um, but feminism for 50 to 60 years in America has been targeting biblical manhood in particular. The feminists, as I show in my forthcoming book, The War on Men, um, actually changed the Lord's Prayer to be gender neutral and actually not just gender neutral, but to pray to mother God. So there are threads here. There's a lot running through this. And Daryl and I have put a lot on the table for you already. And there ain't no way we are getting to 28 questions, by the way. <laughs> no, no, we're not. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to try to give you value for your dollar here. We just have to stand against the evisceration of men. Men are being cut down where they stand, and it is a tragedy. Boys are being told they're toxic for being assertive, aggressive, risk takers. It's hard to sit still in a classroom for eight hours a day. It's hard for a boy. That's, there's nothing wrong with that boy. That's just the way that boy is wired. He wasn't wired to sit in a classroom still for eight hours a day. But our culture is saying boyness and manhood is bad, and the scripture 
does not teach that. The scripture teaches that at the head of all this activity of standing against evil that we're talking about is a strong, godly father. That is the one who is appointed by God to be head of his wife, to be the head of his home, to be leader in the church, to be a leader in the public square and in society. You think of Proverbs 31, the husband is out at the city gates. It doesn't mean that we don't honor and esteem what women do in all sorts of ways. We do. Their vocation is just as valuable as a man's vocation. Absolutely. The woman is called the helper of her husband because she helps him. But I digress. We must have strong men stand up. Don't give them your boys. Don't let them take your boys. Don't let them neuter your boys. Don't let them anesthetize your boys. We've got to train boys to be men in the church through the power of the gospel or else we will be overrun with evil men. You see, the thing is, when you demonize biblical manhood, when you tell men in a society, be soft, be gentle, be feminine. It's right for men to be gentle, but that's not all men are called to be. When you, when you say that to men and you speak that spell over boys and men, the evil men don't disappear. They don't magically go away. They actually proliferate. What you have to have if you're going to face them down is you have to have men who can meet them in strength. Men who by the grace of God will stand up in public. Men who by the grace of God will fight for the good of their wife. Men who by the grace of God will say, what is my kid looking at on this device? Um, there's a lot more to say, but we, we have got to go the exact opposite direction of Karl Marx and his band of Marxists who want to destroy men. We've got to ennoble men by the power of God's grace. I was interviewing um, Erwin Lutzer two weeks ago on this issue, and he said the interesting thing when you study evil is that evil never stops until it is confronted. It will only continue. It will continue to continue unless it's confronted. And so that, that's what we need being built up in order to confront the evil that's going on. So now I want to switch gears for a minute, and I want to talk a very practical question we were asked, which is we were, we we're wondering how to respond to a family invitation to a gay wedding. Sounds like this is a question that is yeah, on your was, hearts and was, on your minds. Uh, I was just, I was quite alert to the audible responses to that right, question. Yes. Um, I'll go ahead and start and hand it over yeah. to. Matter of fact, I'll just answer this question and then I'll, I'll show myself out. But. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, I've been here before, so I know my way around, kind of. So. <laughs> Security won't need to escort me out. I'll show you me. haven't been here enough, though. I'm just saying that. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, you see oh, that. Oh, man, come on. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You know, that's one of those questions. That question, I've heard that question posed before. And every time it's posed, you get the same response. There's a certain sensitivity. There's something within us, for some reason, that raises the antenna whenever that hypothetical is raised, for some reason. Unlike other questions, again, just speaking from my experience, that's, that, that question is somewhat unique in, in the, the way it gets the reaction that it does. And um, my, experience is, is, my experience has been when, when that question is raised, that is the one question that is guaranteed to divide believers, regardless of how you answer it, for some reason. And in that division, it reflects, sadly, an absence of grace. It does. It reflects an absence of grace in such a way that regardless of how you answer the question or what your position is on the question, uh, it's, it's just grossly divisive it just it just 
there's something within us that a question that that particular question grips us on the inside for some reason to where we just plant a flag in the ground, turn our backs to one another and just go our separate ways. And I don't understand why that is. Um, now, let me answer the question, but I, that concerns me that there's there's so so little grace that we afford to one another in responding to this question. That, that hurts. It really does. Now, let me answer the question. The question was, uh, John, repeat the question. I don't want to get the question wrong. So the question is, um, let me re make sure I get it here. We're wondering how to respond to a family invitation to a gay wedding. All right. Let me, let me exchange pronouns and put myself in that situation. I won't speak for the questioner. If a family member invited me to a gay wedding, I would go. And I'm going to need a few minutes here. I would go. I would go in the evangelical fervor of John the Baptist to proclaim to them and everyone there the gospel of Jesus Christ and to encourage them, beg them to repent before they make this decision make, that may cost them their eternal soul. What I don't want any of you sitting here tonight to hear me say that my decision to go, to be present, is in any way an affirmation of the ceremony that's gonna take place. I have not said that. There is no such thing, by the way, as a gay marriage. Now you may have a gay wedding, but you will never have a gay marriage, never. Marriage is, has been, and always will be a sacrament of God, a holy God. And I don't care how the culture tries to appropriate that in terms of the vernacular, in terms of the ceremony, that will never be, God will never, ever bless that. I would go hoping that a door would be open to me to proclaim the gospel to someone there who is celebrating this gross sin. That's what I want you to hear me say. Don't just hear me say, yeah, I would go. Understand the context in which I say I will go. Now, John, if I might have a little grace, speaking of grace, if I have a little bit of grace, there's some scriptures that come to mind that I want to try to share with you that may help contextualize this for you. Because we're talking about Christ in the culture. Christ in the culture. Let me go to, first of all, uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Let me go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. Just trying to establish some context here. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. This is the Apostle Paul essentially chastising the Corinthians for their immorality. And Paul was so disturbed by the level of immorality that, was being, that had been reported to him that was occurring amongst the Corinthian believers. It was so gross. It was so egregious that he said this to them. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 5. He said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with the moral period. Oh, I'm sorry, people. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with the moral people. That's not a period right there. There's a semicolon. Verse 10, I did not at all mean to not associate with the immoral people of this world. Did you hear that? I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral or immoral people of this world, immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. 
Verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. So we've got this thing inverted. When it comes to the whole gay uh, wedding thing, we've got this idea. So, oh, no, 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 no. I have to distance myself from stuff like that. But Paul's saying the exact opposite. He's telling you that as a Christian in this culture, that's exactly where you need to be. Presence is not affirmation. It's not affirmation. Paul is unambiguous here. He said, I wrote to you not to associate with immoral people, but in that letter, I didn't mean that you should not associate with the immoral people of this world. That's where I want you. The people I want you to distance yourself from are so-called brothers who are living immoral lives. Those are the folks I want you to distance yourself from. Now, just to add to that, let's go to Luke 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus, it says this, And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well, who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. Now, talking about grace, listen, the question that, that the uh, questioner posed is not one that we, this isn't an agree or disagree situation. I'm just trying to establish for you biblically to give you some biblical context as to why Daryl Harrison, if this situation applied to me, why I would say, yes, I would be there. One last one. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. James 5, verses 19 and 20. Again, Saying yes, hope, hoping, praying, begging God to give me an opportunity to call the participants of the ceremony to repentance. James 5, 19 and 20. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, whether you agree with me or not, on the decision that I would make. Is this making sense? Is this making sense? Now, I, I would subsume, subsume 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, Luke 5, 31 through 32, James 5, 19 and 20. I would subsume all of those verses underneath the heading of John 17, 15. John 17, 15, real quick. This is where Jesus says, as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane to his heavenly father, he says this. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Now, there's a reason for that. Christ has saved us and left us here. Not to have a static lifeless existence to where we try to avoid the uh, mores and paradigms and problems and ills that are antithetical to scripture. How are you going to be a city on a hill? Jesus said this. How are you going to be a city on a hill if you hide your lamp under a bed? How are you going to be salt and light if you're tasteless, if your salt is tasteless and you're, you have no illumination whatsoever to your light. Now, this is an individual. Th th this is what makes this question so deep. Is because when, in, in, in answering the question, you're also trying to allay uh and avoid, avert any assumptions being made by the hearer as to what you mean <laughs> in responding to the question. This is not an easy question. This is not. 
However, again, I would say this. I just want you to understand why Daryl, if a family member invited me, because you never know, that may be the last opportunity you get to share the gospel with that person. You don't know that. But for me, if a family member invited me, and if, if a family member invited me, they have to know already where I stand on this stuff. And if they don't know, they're going to know. They're going to know now. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, I'll turn it over to Owen here. But again, I think, I think um, notwithstanding your own position on this, the motivation for me to accept such an invitation will be to call those people to repent because their souls are at stake. They just don't understand that. That they're in the dark, their souls are at stake, and I want to have, I want to at least have the opportunity, whether it comes to fruition or not, I at least want to have the opportunity to plead with them. Because God can move their hearts in that one second that I have with them. To plead with them, to repent, to ask forgiveness, to, to, to turn their heart to Christ. Because their, their soul is at, at stake for eternity, for a moment of lustful satisfaction, which is probably why they're engaging in this ceremony to begin with, to be honest with you. So take it, bro. I'm very thankful to participate in this viral video that is now <laughs> going to go around the world. Um, <laughs> The guy sitting on the couch. I just, uh, hope, I just hope I don't lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> you just said to everybody, lose your job for the right thing, right? So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was that that answer really made me think. Um, we talked about this on the Redeeming Truth podcast earlier today, and um, he made me think there. And so I would not go to the gay wedding, putting that in air quotes. Um, I, I don't think I could do that uh, because there is a sense of participation in the ceremony. But what I would affirm and what Daryl said and affirm in the strongest terms and what he's pushing me to think about is being a gospel witness. And I think... I think the church today is feeling so attacked by our culture, as John said at the start of this discussion, that we almost think our mission terminates in just not being worldly. And our mission doesn't terminate there because we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to not be in, uh, not be of the world, but be in it. We're, and I think we're losing some of that today. I think we're losing that. That's a great point gospel momentum and mandate. We've even got guys on social media now, I alluded to this earlier, but telling us um, actively to leave hard areas in, in order to form a, a Christian culture elsewhere. Christians have freedom, okay? We do very badly with freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Christians have a whole heaping bunch of freedom in terms of where they live. Bible doesn't say where you need to live. You can live here. You can live elsewhere. So let it not be heard that I'm saying you cannot move if it's a hard place. I don't think that. But I would just say the biblical principle, the gospel mandate is to actually not shy away from the contact sport of being in hard places. It's to be in hard places and it's to do things like upend the ceremony and preach Jesus mm -hmm. when nobody wants him preached. Right. right. That's what we're here for. That's literally what we're here for. So couldn't go to the ceremony, but love the gospel mandate that my, my brother's articulating. And I want you to notice something too, that in a day where if a Christian disagrees with each other, with another Christian, that you're now forced to choose sides. And I like this guy and not that guy. And I'm, I'm on, I'm on team Daryl and, and, and I'm on, I'm on team Owen. And then you got to fight each other. I just want you to notice the gracious way that two Christians disagreed with each other, didn't cancel each other, didn't start going at each other, but there is a real sense that they can disagree agreeably and still keep 
community with each other, which is what we're commanded to do over and over and over again. If you spend any time on social media, especially Twitter, you know that that never happens at all. And so I want you to see a better way. I want you to see in that a a massive example, number one. But number two, I also want you to see that those who foment conflict in those places are not acting Christianly. No matter how much, how courageous it looks, just be very careful of that. What you just saw is Christian disagreement. And that's a good thing for all of us to recognize and not just recognize it, but to repeat it. Okay, makes sense. All right. So I'm going to ask, ask another practical question. Oh, I'm going to turn to you for this one. And the question is, um, I'm going to reword the question, but it's basically if you're um, if you found out that your child was being taught uh, by a, a woke activist, what would your response to that be? If two or, we have three questions like that in this in this list. Yeah, like a lot of these questions, these aren't theoretical questions. Nope. These used to be theoretical questions 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. Now they're not. Now they're practical. And so I have great compassion for a father and mother, husband and wife in this scenario, because again, people are facing this. And it used to be that you could trust institutions, right? A lot of you remember this growing up. You could send your kids to the local neighborhood school and trust they were generally, maybe not get a Christian education, of course, but at least get a solid one and things were going to be fine. Without the agenda woven into it. Without some horrific agenda. Now, you, uh, you send your child or some of you grandkids, your grandkids are sent to schools from Christian homes with good intentions and they get social emotional learning. Uh, where the questions on day one are about, do you feel safe in your home? And are you in a church context? And is that church context creating safety? Has anyone trained you to think in a harmful or bad way? And you get some nine-year-old who knows nothing of this, and there's a subtle agenda that's being forced upon your child. So if this is happening, I would make an appointment Oh boy, would I make an appointment (laughs) and I would try to go in and Ephesians 415 under the calming influence of the Holy Spirit, speak truth and love to this teacher. I would try to be a gospel witness. My man's excellent point a minute ago. I would then make appointments with every administrator within a mile. And I would try to talk to them about this agenda that is targeting my child. I would ask that this teacher be removed respectfully. I would go to board meetings and try to make that happen. Now, the problem is in many places, it's not one teacher, right? It's many teachers. It's an entire school. Yes. We got a lot of response to that. Sometimes an entire district. Sometimes an entire district. So all schools are not alike. I am not the guy whose public thing is there's only one option for Christians. It's only this. I think we have freedom there. The Bible does not answer that question. And if your if your kids had a woke teacher, that'd be super awkward. Right? <laughs> I would give them the book Christianity and Wokeness um, for kids. I was, no, I mean your, your, your teacher is, is your wife, so that would yeah, be, yeah, 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 be yeah, totally yeah. awkward. I would give my wife the book Christianity and Wokeness. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, didn't pick up on that one. Yeah. My kids are homeschooled. This is, um, <laughs> that's got, bro, I need marriage just, counseling. Just keep going. You can't get out of this one. I need marriage. Oh, counseling. He's going to gay weddings and I need marriage counseling. Right. Okay. We're, we're in trouble, bro. Somebody play the music. Um, I can hear Mozart's Requiem in the back of my head right now. Because you're, you're dead, bro. You're toast. <laughs> Host. My, my wife is homeschooling her kids and doing an awesome job at it. And so um, I think it's a great time. Summary comment. Last comment. For Christians, whatever they're doing, public, Christian, homeschool, all viable, depending on who's teaching the kids, what the school district's like, et cetera. Whether mom can handle homeschooling, real issue. Whether the Christian school is sound real matter. But it's a time for us all as fathers and mothers to take the utmost responsibility for our children. Do not coast. 
this is the theme of the night, I think, in yeah, some way. Right. Yep. Do, do not assume that everything's good just because it always has been good. Lock in. Fathers, pay attention. If you haven't been paying enough attention to this moment, good news. There's grace in Jesus Christ for you. Repent, ask God to forgive you, and lock in now and protect that child. Do the best uh, action for the, for the child in question. John, can I just say something? Uh, Owen said that right there at the uh, latter part of his comment when he talked about just because things are good, don't assume that they're going to continue to be good. <coughs> um, one reason the, the public school system in terms of wokeness has gotten so bad in that regard is because we have coasted. Uh, you see, the woke play the long game. They've been waiting on this for 80 years. What conservatives will do, we want to win in one moment of time. And when we get that win, we, we, we take, we, you know, unfold our lazy boy, chill out, get a stogie and a lemonade. And <laughs> <clears throat> but see, the, the woke play the long game. I'll give them credit for that. They've waited generations for this moment right here. What you're seeing right now is a manifestation of your great, great, great grandparents' generation. Um, and, and we have to recognize that. You have to learn your enemy's playbook. And your enemy is willing to wait you out. That's why you have not just teachers, you've got administrators, you've got um, local mayors, Governors, Congress people, presidents. These people are in those positions because they represent an ideology. In the schools, forget it. Public schools, forget it. Education is not the mandate anymore. The mandate is indoctrination. It's not a teacher-student dynamic anymore. It's not even a teacher-parent dynamic anymore. It's a teacher-comrade relationship. Because, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that, if, you, if, if the word communism comes to mind, rightly so. You have teachers who are graduating from these higher institutions of academic learning and these principals of these schools with PhDs in sociology, anthropology, philosophy, <clears throat> for the sole purpose of coming out of those institutions and getting into your local neighborhoods, taking possession of the minds of your children and shutting you out of their lives forever. That's the goal of the public school system. This is what John Dewey wanted, by the way the father of public schools. He always viewed public, do we always view public schools as an entity to shape the minds of the children from a social standpoint? Reading, writing, and arithmetic was just a means to get them in. And I think to a large extent, back to Owen's point about coasting and just assuming that everything is good. See, now we're realizing the payoff of our apathy so to echo my brother here, you got to dig in. Nothing's good anymore. They want your children. You have parents now fighting with you. Who ever thought this? That parents would be in a position to where they're having to file lawsuits to establish that, no, my, that's my child. I have authority over that child, not you. There are lawsuits being filed to establish what is an inherent right, an unalienable right of the parents who physically are responsible for that child existing. I'm having to fight your teacher? Dig in and dig in for the long haul. So I've got one more question, but I know that you also, Daryl, um, you recently did a redeeming, a. Um, just Thinking podcast on climate change. 
And so if people, if you, if you have a question about that, um, so people have, uh, if you have a question about that, how could they find that podcast? Uh, Daryl. Thanks Dale for the order. Um, so you can go to just me, hit the podcast link and it's going to be episode 124. It'll be the most recent episode on the top row of the list, or you can uh, preferably subscribe to the Justing podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. But yeah, so thanks for, thanks for mentioning that, John. Yeah, so Virgil and I recently released a nearly four-hour episode titled The Biblical Theology of Climate Change. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with our podcast, Just Thinking is a long-form expositional podcast where we take social, political, theological, cultural topics and we exegete those topics in an expositional way through what the Word of God says. So our podcast is unique in that most of our episodes are quite lengthy. Uh, they can run two, two and a half, three, three and a half hours. I think our critical race theory episode was right at four hours. Um, uh, we, we, we take our time and we walk you through every single topic. So what you're going to find when you listen to the uh, biblical theology of uh, climate change, our fundamental thesis is that climate change is not what many people assume it is. It is not about environmental stewardship. It is not. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you. You have to listen to the episode yourself. <laughs> Take as long as you have to listen. That's the cool thing about podcasts. You can pace it at your own uh, rate and listen to it over however long it takes you to do that. But I will say this, and I say this in all humility, you will not hear anything anywhere like this uh, when it comes to this issue of climate change. Um, we, we walk you through, first of all, a definition of what climate change is being contradistinct from environmental stewardship. So we establish that number one. And then we also establish how fundamentally the entire climate change movement is rooted in Darwinian evolution. Uh, and as we normally do, we cite firsthand sources. So for this episode here, I think Virgil and I combined, we had close to 40 pages of notes and over 120 footnotes for this episode. By the way, let me just announce, you will be the first to hear this. Um, and this will bring more context after you listen to the episode. But G3 Ministries has agreed to publish this episode as a book slash study guide that we anticipate being released in the first quarter of 2024. Um, uh, but so so from from Darwinian evolution, we also connect it to spiritual paganism uh, going all the way back to the 1960s and worshiping Gaia, Gaianism, Mother Earth uh, and, and how abortion and population reduction is a fundamental tenet of the climate change movement. So we take nearly four hours to establish and make unarguably clear that climate change is not about environmental stewardship. It is not about putting litter in its place, okay? It is not about oil spills. This is a pagan religion. And we're gonna establish that for you in that episode by citing climate change sources firsthand. So when you listen to the Justin Podcast, you never get opinions. We're gonna cite firsthand sources to establish for you from their own mouths what climate change is. And just to entice you a little bit more, at about halfway, at about the two hour mark, I walk you through a definition of Guyanism. Then I walk you through a definition of what the Guyanists called Gaia theory. And then I walk you through what they call the Gaia way. So this is the way, but the Gaia way is quickly that you sacrifice everything that has value to you for the sake of Mother Earth. The Gaia way encourages you to dissolve your familial relationships, to give up your way of life, to sacrifice your religious principles for the sake of, quote, healing the planet. So climate change is fundamentally religious paganism on steroids. So I encourage you Go to Just Thinking, that's one word, justthinking.me, click the podcast link. You can listen to the episode online there at our website, or you can subscribe to the Just Thinking podcast wherever you, we're, we're all across, it doesn't matter what platform you listen to your podcast on. I strongly encourage you to listen to this episode, and then after you're done, to share it with everyone you know. Uh, again, you will not hear an exposition, a biblical exposition of climate change, anywhere else like you're going to hear on the Justin and podcast.
Thank you for that. Um, Owen, question for you. You've got a couple books coming out. Um, can you tell our audience here about that? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I love the Just Thinking podcast. I'm so thankful for Daryl and Virgil Walker, just excellent men. So love and it. And we, we have one more question after this, just giving you the opportunity to, to introduce yourself more to the audience. But I've got one last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the books that I have coming out are The War on Men, which I mentioned earlier, that comes out October 3rd. And um, I'm aiming straight at the culture that is telling our boys that they are toxic, telling men that they're toxic for being strong. So I pray that the war on men can help and encourage some, some brothers in the church and also hopefully make some disciples out there in the broader culture. So the war on men comes out in early October and the warrior savior, I seem to have war on the mind, uh, <laughs> subconsciously, the warrior savior comes out in January, 2024. And that is about the atonement. It's about the cross of Christ. And it's, um, really a theme theological slash biblical study of atonement throughout the Bible. Very quickly, I'll just say this. A lot of skeptics and atheists prey on your children and grandchildren and, uh, and ours by saying the God of the New Testament is loving, but the God of the Old Testament is angry. Raise your hands if you have ever heard some version of that line. A lot of people have heard that. The opposite is true. The God of the Old Testament is the God who promises the head crusher in Genesis 3.15. The God of the Old Testament is the God who has Isaiah sing about the cross, the coming Messiah, who will lay his life down and carry our sins. His head will be bruised and we will come away forgiven. So the God of the Old Testament is the most profoundly loving God imaginable. And tragically, um, the burden of the book is really to communicate um, that tragically a lot of people haven't really heard much about the God of love. Um, some people have grown up in churches even where they have heard even Christians that God is, is angry at them in, in a kind of ongoing state. And that has trickle down effects into marriages and families and kids. And there are teens who grow up in contexts like that legalistic, fundamentalistic context, honestly, to some degree, they're not all the same, but they grow up and they think God is mad at them. Even as they are a Christian, our sin uh, offends God, grieves God, Ephesians 430. But what I'm trying to go after in the warrior savior for the average reader is this because of Christ, God is not angry at you. You should pursue a holy life. We all should. Yes, we don't want to grieve the spirit. We can. But fundamentally, God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament reveals himself as a God of the most profound, steadfast, patient, enduring, tender love imaginable. In fact, it will take all eternity for us to experience the love of God. And that's all found in the cross. Amen. So, so last question, guys, how would we, how should we approach the transgender movement, uh, which is openly being pushed in our society? Can I just be blunt again? <clears throat> this, this, I don't know if I can recall any element of the culture that makes that makes me more righteously indignant indignant than the transgender movement <clears throat> the manifold destruction of lives is is just breathtaking in in, in its depravity Transgender might be the most nonsensical term in our vernacular today. Gender does not transition. It does not transition because it cannot transition. Until science comes up with a diabolical way to change a person's chromosomes, Everything else is just butchery. 
Everything else is just butchery. When you have, when you call it transition, by definition, see, this is what I mean about exegeting the culture. You have to exegete the language. What do you mean by transition? Transition is something that happens by osmosis. You don't have to manufacture it. Top surgeries and bottom surgeries, see, that's manufacturing. Uh, it's manufacturing a mirage. Transgender is a mirage. It's a biological, physiological mirage. And they're targeting the youngest among us. You know, Ecclesiastes says that God made man upright, but he has devised many schemes. I mean, you think about Jeremiah 17, 9, where the heart of the human heart is sick and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now you see why that's a rhetorical question. Because it's like our depravity as sinners is 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 so deep that we're testing that rhetorical question. Oh, okay, God, you Jeremiah, you're asking this rhetorical question. Well, let me just show you how depraved we can get. The transgender movement is, in my estimation, as we sit here today, incomparable. And it's hatred of God to where you literally physiologically want to strip away the Imago Dei from boys and girls. And you have them, see this is part of the whole public school thing as well. When you tell a girl, you've just been born in the wrong body. You need to have top surgery. You need to take these uh, uh, medication, these hormones, and all this. You need to. You see, you, 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 your, your feelings are. They're taking advantage of emotional naivete to butcher these children and make a lot of money doing it and get incredibly wealthy. I was looking at some data the other day because Virgil and I are, are we're, we're we're trying to decide. The next episode of the Justin Your Podcast, do we want to do it on, well, there's three topics that we're considering right now. One is transgenderism. One is uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and the other is the Enneagram. Uh, so we haven't landed on either one of those yet, um, but it's my show, so I'll probably make the call. <laughs> <laughs> but the transgender movement makes me so angry. I don't even get this angry when we're talking about slavery. I don't get angry at, about that. But this, dude, that's just something. When you talk about what the enemy, the enemy coming to kill, kill, steal, and destroy, yeah, yeah. I cannot think of a, a more tangible example of that than this transgender movement. Where you, and listen, here's the thing about it. You've got these children's own parents doing this to them. Yeah. Their own parents. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, man. This, I'm gonna this double team. Me. No, let's double team it. Uh, let me let me let me nuance and qualify what has been said and soften it. Transgenderism is the doctrine of demons. And I'm not joking. It is, it is the doctrine of demons. What, what he's expressing emotionally is what we, I think, probably all of us feel. Um, to, to target children in particular is so wicked. It's so evil. It's never been done. Our society... Our society is under judgment now. It's under judgment for these things to be n normed and mainstreamed. So that I don't say that to leave you hopeless and, and fearful and shaking at the end of this very significantly consequential night of Q&A. 
I, I say it because we just have to grapple with the world as it is in the common grace sphere, in the public square. That's why Jordan Peterson has had such a profound effect because he's, he's in his own way from his own worldview, looking at the world and going, this is not okay. This is not normal in a related sense. It is not normal that men are going into women's locker rooms. It is not normal that boys are going into little girls' bathrooms. This is wicked. We are, we are surrounded by wickedness. And for, um, for adults, teachers, education, professionals to tell kids they can change their body is the doctrine of demons. And I don't have some amazing three-point thing to say at the end here. I just would simply say in conclusion of this evening, uh, for my part, we, we are not God. We cannot make everything right. Only Jesus is going to make the world right. And wow, is Jesus going to make the world right. Find hope in that. F find more hope in Jesus than you find um, sorrow in this world. Just watch your heart in that way. But I'm reminded, for, for my part again, in concluding, I'm reminded of this movie Dunkirk a few years ago, um, telling the true story of Dunkirk, the evacuation of the British Army in May, June 1940. And there's this scene in Christopher Nolan's film where all the men, basically, all the British soldiers who were about to be destroyed, annihilated by the German forces have been evacuated. Basically, all of them got home. Incredible historical moment. But there's, there's, this, um, there's this leader, this authority figure left, played by Kenneth Branagh. And um, the, the last remaining officers on the, on the um, apparatus where all the soldiers were go down to the boat to go home. And the, the leader shuts, Kenneth Branagh shuts the fence and stays. He stays up on the dangerous ground. He, he's, he's staying to get the last man out. He's not leaving until the last man gets out. And it reminds me, sorry I'm getting choked up, but these are consequential things. What they're doing to our children um, takes your breath away. So... I find hope in this. <laughs> I find hope in this. Jesus is not leaving until everyone gets out. All of us are getting out. And any of those precious kids who are being targeted now, when they know Christ, by God's grace, they're all getting out. So find hope in that. Amen. So... It's such an appropriate time to conclude, but um, to answer this question well, you have, you've spoken very clearly on the response that we should have in the truth aspect to this. But there is also a love aspect to this that is equally important. And it's not just love for our children. It's not just love for... Um, but it's also love for the people who are propagating this stuff. And so I would like us to conclude on that note. Yeah, I'll just throw in quickly. Um, absolutely. We have a gospel that is ready for sinners of every kind. We have a gospel so powerful it saved us. Think about that. So if the gospel can save you and me, the gospel can save the transgender advocate. The gospel can save the public school principal ushering wokeness in by the bucket load. The gospel can save the politician currently destroying America. And so what is needed ultimately is not for us to launch a movement of nationalism and reclaim America or Christianize it. Um, we should be salt and light as much as we possibly can. We want good laws. We want Christians in office, all of that. Yes. And amen. What is needed, I would argue is for the church to do exactly what you just pointed to John. It's for us to go out and evangelize like like crazy. It's for us to get to know our neighbors. It's for us to share the gospel, proclaim Christ as much as we can. So um, we, we want to stand against the evil that we've, that we've called out. And we must do that. We must say to Satan, you are not having my kids. Um, or if you are, you're having them over my dead body. 
But we, as we say that, want to say to real unbelievers just like us, I know a gospel that saved a wretch like me. And so we, we are again left not in fear, not in quavering terror, not in despair. We are the people of gospel hope. And so go out and proclaim Christ, lock in, fight hard, and um, Jesus is going to get us all home. Yeah, John, as I think about that sort of landing on, on love as we conclude here, I would just leave every one of you with these six words from the Apostle Paul. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Amen. That there, we are called to live in attention of truth and love as we exist in Babylon. Well, thank you, men, very much. Can you thank them? Hey, thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.